I'm here at SSCR 24 on July 23rd, 2012, with uh, Mr. Eucalides, who's from uh, the, the Finnish de uh, delegation. And uh, I'd like to start, first of all, by um, just asking if you could just uh, give your name and, and, and where you work for in, in Finland and briefly and explain uh, why you're here uh, this week in Geneva. Well, I'm Jukka Liedes from the Finnish Ministry of Education and Culture, and I'm here in order to be present when we try to make progress in WIPO in the Permanent Committee on related, Copyright and Related Rights uh, in matters concerning uh, limitations and exceptions for the benefit of the visual people, persons with visual impairment, and then also uh, doing work in order to make progress in the project uh, to establish uh, updating a treaty on the broadcaster's protection. And uh, <coughs> Yuka, uh, how long have you been coming to WIPO meetings? You've been here, you've been doing this a long time, right? Yes, I have been here. I was uh, in this house, uh, in this building already at the end of 70s. And then uh, from the beginning of 80s, I have been here. Uh, participating in meetings. <laughs> and uh, 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 you were chair of, of, of the Copyright Committee. Were you, were you chair before there was an SSCR or, or the first SSCR? What was your, what was your, your tenure as a chair? Because it's quite unusual in this institution, I believe. I mean, you've, you've, you've done it many times, right? <laughs> yes, I came many times. I came, I came virtually to every meeting dealing with copyright and related rights. And then uh, from uh, the January 86 on, I was elected as chair for various committees. So I had already, before the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, I, was, I had been acted some more than 10 years, as, uh, maybe 12 years, as, as chair of different committees. And you played a role, didn't you, in the, uh, in the 1996 WIPO Copyright Treaty? and the WPPT negotiations? Yes, I happen to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but were you involved in any of the preparatory work? Or? I uh, drafted every document. <laughs> and then went to every <laughs> all continents <laughs> in order to <laughs> present the proposals, etc. Are you, are you a member of something called the Stockholm Group? Yes, the Stockholm Group was uh, established some 20 years ago. It was a small group uh, in order to uh, uh, facilitate the um, the uh, progress in in the then negotiations. Because I, you know, I, I wasn't ever able to find anything much. Um, you know, I don't know. There's no Wikipedia entry for it. There's not. They don't have a website or anything like that. Is that? Is it just kind of an informal yes. group? And um, they're not listed as a formal group within WIPO, though, right? It's an. It it has been an informal group that uh, was meeting. Uh, uh, in the uh, pro progress leading to uh, the um, uh, 96 and 2000 uh, diplomatic conferences, maybe uh, maybe more than 50, but less than 100 times. Wow, and uh, it still meets. Is that correct? Yes, rarely. Oh, re sometimes. much much more rarely yes. now. I see. Yes. Okay. Do you know how many members it had? There were 12 uh, members. Is it is it common knowledge what who the twelve are? Or is, I assume that I assume that Sweden and Finland, the United States. Yeah, it was uh, Sweden as, as it, the group was established in Stockholm, as the name tells. Uh huh. And then the uh, the uh, group is uh, in fact a non-group. It it meets uh, uh, nowadays uh, at uh, very irregular intervals. Okay. Um, <coughs> Well, I should ask you a question about the negotiations here. So, um, in terms of the issue of people with disabilities, um, does Finland have a position on what the nature of the instrument should be? We have uh, not had any reason to define a position on the nature of the instrument yet, but the uh, moment will come now after the summer weeks when we will then uh, also from the political level that is government and parliament give an opinion on 
what should be the nature of the instrument? Well, uh, <clears throat> I mean, this meeting ends on Wednesday. Does that mean that um, that you you have no position or a a a a, a no treaty position, or do you have any position at all? If something, if they were to decide on you know between now and Wednesday, does that does that mean that? We're, we're just kind of we're kind of hoping we can get a decision out by Wednesday about what the recommendation would be to the General Assembly. That's difficult to say because Wednesday is still far, far away from to, today. Today's Monday, right? Yes, today's Monday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, on the on the broadcasters' treaty, do you do you do you have, do you have anything would you like to share on that? I mean, I, I, most of the people there. Some of the people that will listen to this are like deeply into the weeds, and other people are just trying to figure out. They don't even, you know, not even sure, you know, what what it means. Some of us that are attending it are still not sure what it is. So I, I just wonder if anything you wanted to add to to just deepen people's understanding of why WIPO is struggling with a treaty as it relates to broadcasters in the first place. Well, the project and process started uh, some 14 years ago after the 1996 uh, diplomatic conference. In fact, the 1996 diplomatic conference issued, decided, adopted uh, a political declaration asking for uh, the updating of the protection of broadcasting organizations. And then when the work started, then quite soon, uh, there were proposals from, if I remember correctly, 15 sta member states of WIPO and groups of uh, member states of WIPO, uh, in even in treaty language, uh, suggesting that uh, international enhanced protection should be established. So that was uh, uh, the, there was not much questioning in the, in the beginning of the project. Now, the questioning of why, what is this, why is this, and what is this, uh, after all, even in technical and legal terms, it started uh, around 2006-2007. We are there now in that debate. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, when I go back and I look at the early discussions of the 1962 Rome Convention, uh, I think it was 1962, uh, it, it uh, it seemed that the, the high cost of, of doing broadcasting was one of the rationales for this special extra layer of, of protection. But, I mean, nowadays, uh, people can broadcast using their cell phone. I mean, it's, things have changed quite a bit. And, and you have the internet, and you have kind of a different world. I just wonder if, if the idea of creating special rights for broadcasters has the same rationale today as it did a long time ago. Well, the... Um 1961 Rome Convention. 61. I'm sorry. <laughs> had its, has its own uh, history of establishing or birth. Uh, I guess uh, there was a growing concept in people's mind on what these, uh, uh, what then became related rights or neighboring rights, as they were called, uh, should comprise, and, and then the broadcasting organ, uh, organizations were, were added to the beneficiaries of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, protection. Now, uh, I think the world has changed quite since then, and uh, if we now would establish the philosophy on, on which uh, and, for, uh, and, and list of reasons why there is protection of broadcasting organizations for some of us here in this room, it is the anti-piracy uh, function of a, of a treaty against uh, uh, illoyal activities uh, using uh, or free, ri free riding on the broadcasters' investment. For others, it is to establish for broadcasters a place in the all the time more and more complex communications market where the broadcasters are now, they were not before, now they are surrounded by, by all kinds of operators, economic operators, and the broadcasters should have a possibility to place them in that jungle. 
uh, in including uh, they, they could and should have a possibility to license the use of their signals. Is it, is, uh, isn't copyright a sufficient mechanism to do with piracy? Yes, copyright certainly uh, gives a good, good, already a good possibility to, to uh, work against piracy. And then if there is a, pro a protection for broadcasters as one economic operator, then of course the, they, the broadcasters, would have their own proper means to act against piracy. But I mean, can't they, if they broadcast some copyrighted content and somebody pirates it, why, why can't they obtain sufficient rights from the copyright owner to go after people who infringe? My guess would be that the copyright owners are copyright owners, uh, they own the content, and the broadcasting organization uh, uh, normally has a feeling that it owns its own input and the signal and the the programming that, that the signal carries and the broadcasters are, are best equipped themselves to take care of their, their own interest in this environment. So, so how long does the signal last? I noticed in the current draft they said 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, the signal lasts a billion years because because some part of the signal is pro propagating in the outer space <laughs> and we know that the light has been propagating from those <laughs> from the first big bang already billions of years towards us <laughs> but but seriously i mean if there's a copyrighted show and it's on a television program and somebody infringes it doesn't the copyright owner shouldn't they the ones that have all the decisions to make about what to do about the infringement? Yeah. It is, of course, not the signal that, uh, that is protected, uh, protected if you look at the fixation and the post-fixation yeah. things that may happen. So yeah. it's, it's then the uh, result, the output and result of the investment of the, of the broadcaster that is used. It is the, it is the, pro the content, the programming that was, uh, and the investment that this implied that, that is used by third parties. And then now the idea is that the broadcaster should have also a say, say concerning that. You know, in the, in the United States, we don't, we never signed the uh, 1961 <laughs> Rome Convention, and, and, um, and yet it's illegal to pirate television shows. Maybe, that is one of the important reasons why we are sitting here and trying to establish <laughs> some uh, fair treatment of broadcasters. <laughs> Do you think we need a bookseller, right? Because they, they, <laughs> they're having a tough time these days, too. They no. sell books. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> if I take a newspaper article and put it on my web page, maybe I should get a, a, web, a, a, no, a web page no, right. So, so the, the, uh, what we mean by broadcasters, the, what, what should be protected, if anything, it should be uh, quite like an equivalent for the traditional broadcasting, where there is programming, there, when there, where there is uh, the investment, etc. Are, are you aware of any country where sports broadcasting is not copyrighted? Because this is one of the arguments that come up. People always say, well, we're going to have a, a cricket match or a soccer match, and a World Cup or something, so we need to have a, a broadcast treaty before we have this match. And, and I there was a period when people would come to this meet committee and they'd claim that sports broadcasting wasn't protected by copyright. I know there's been some EU case on this that's quite important recently, but I mean, aren't, aren't most countries considered uh, sports bro sports broadcast to be copyrighted in their countries? Well, I'm not the best the person the best equipped to, to give any reply on that, but I think that the pro sports broadcasts as such enjoy uh, related rights protection, at least in the in the part of the world from where I come. Okay. All right, well, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, Mr. Eagle is a real institution at WIPO, and one of the persons that's helped shape uh, the, live, the world we live in as relate to uh, copyright. Is there anything you'd like to add before I conclude the interview? I think this was a very enlightening and very nice conversation, and I had, had the opportunity to rehearse how it uh, sounds when I try to explain things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>